Doesn't it seem like every year the Christmas season just seems to come faster and faster and we get so busy that we just tend to forget all about what we're supposed to be focusing, the true reason of Christmas? I think we just get too tied up anymore. There's a verse in there that says is the days will get shorter and faster near the end times. Some days I think that is absolutely true. For the last three weeks we have been studying different names of Jesus, what people have called Jesus, different names. Last week we learned that Jesus called himself Lord of the Sabbath, and what was interesting about that is the religious leaders just could not accept him being to him to do that. And what we did learn is that today we're, we need to call him Lord of every day, and that he is our Lord every day, and that not just Lord of the Sabbath, but Lord of every day and, and for a lot of us that's something we need to stop and actually think about first corinthians 12 3 says therefore i make known to you that no one speaking by the spirit of god calls jesus accursed and no one can say that jesus is his lord except by the holy spirit so no wonder they had a hard time back then they had not had the holy spirit in them so that was a struggle for them to call Jesus Lord. And today, we see the same thing. There are people who just cannot call Jesus Lord, you know. And we'll talk a little bit about that. In the news, though, here's an article that should just show us how things are going in the world, even in this Christmas season. Christians shouldn't be allowed to be doctors, say Canadian by ethics. By ethics. Bioethics. One of the most concerning parts of the paper for Christian doctors is the section where the author, authors argue that a doctor's morals and beliefs should never influence his work. In their words, doctors must put patients' interests instead in, ahead of their own integrity. They argue that Canada, that Canada does not have a shortage of doctors or those wanting to become doctors so they can afford to be more selective with who they pick. They argue it is entirely reasonable to admit only doctors who are prepared to do everything the profession, professional legally requires. And of course, what they're talking about is, is abortion and euthanasia and that kind of stuff. What would the world be like if we had doctors who did not have proper ethics? Yeah, we all would, wouldn't it? But if you take away the Christian doctors, and don't fool you, Canada is always just one step ahead of us. This is talk, This is coming out of Canada. So keep an eye on that. On this day and week in history, 2011, last troops leave Iraq leaving behind 157 U.S. soldiers for training. Of course, we later know that we've been adding more troops silently behind the scenes back into that area in Afghanistan. 2009, the Senate passed health care reform bills. Anybody know what that was called today? Obamacare. And remember what the famous statement was? You got to pass it before you can read it so we all know what's in it. Well, now we all know what's in it, don't we? 2004, a tsunami caused by an earthquake under the Indian Ocean leaves 216,000 dead. And I'm sure you all remember that incident of that tsunami that came across there and just wiped out villages and towns. And I mean, it was devastating. 1968, Apollo 8 orbited the moon, becoming the first manned space mission to achieve that feat. In 1968, the music film Chitty Chitty Bang Bang came out. <laughs> Remember that show? 1963, the Berlin Wall opened for the first time with day passes so they could go in between. 1947, Bell's Lab demonstrates the world's first transistor radio. And that's the beginning of a change in the whole world now. Then 1920, what happened on this day in 1920? 1620. 1620. 
1620. What happened today in 1620? The Mayflower landed. Isn't that amazing? When you go back and check history on this stuff that happens in the world today. Let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this day. We ask your blessing as we come to here to, to fellowship and to look in your word, Lord. Most of all, we ask, Lord, that our hearts and minds are open and receptive to what you have for us, Lord. And we just give you the praise and glory throughout this day and this week and all the struggles we go through. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you, I bet, how many of you guys remember the movie or the TV show Family Feud? Remember that one? Who was that guy? Harvey somebody that ran that thing? Richard Dawson? Would it? Yeah, I don't remember who he was. It says that they asked 100 people who would they consider to be the king of today. In your life, who would you call the king of today? Well, we're in church. We ought to pick Jesus, had we? All right. Well, Elvis Presley. How about God or Jesus? Martin Luther King. And what's the other one? Burger King. These were the four highest picks. Let me tell you. I'm just wondering where the rest of them were. But out of 100 people, Elvis Presley got 81. More people think of him as the king than they do Jesus. So that means Jesus got seven. He got seven. Well, how do you think Martin Luther King got? Three. And, of course, Burger King got two. So can you imagine all the others? Because that adds up to, what, 81, 87, 90 what? 93. So there's seven other people that got at least one vote didn't they? But do you kind of see where Jesus fell into the picture in people's mind? If you, were, if you were to call some, oops, and I hit the wrong button. If you were to call somebody Lord and King, and I'm sure I docked it out, Stan, where would we fall at? All right, he's going to fix me there. Well, I want to ask you about today. Do you know today if you ask people today, who do you think Jesus is? They'll tell you Jesus is a prophet. Most people know of Jesus. When you say the name of Jesus, they, most people know who you're talking about. They call him a prophet. It says 1.2 billion Muslims today refer to Jesus as a prophet. The fact is they call him one of the greatest prophets there is. But that's as far as they're going to go. They're not going to call him Savior or Lord, are they? You know? Yep. All right, I'm still working on this thing. Okay, Jesus was a legend. Do you know that? There's people who think Jesus was a fictional character. People write of him as a fictional character on it. You know? They don't look at the Bible as a history book. They look at it as a fictional book. And he was just a character in that book, the main character. Or Jesus was a moral teacher. This is probably the most common view in our culture today, that he was a good man, great teacher, and probably the best of all men. But nowhere does they call him Lord and Savior in there. And this is the view of a lot of people. This is the view of people even in our own community around us and you would think that in our community that people would know who Jesus is well C.W. Lewis he wrote this he said this is to refute this view he was, wrote this he says I am trying here to prevent anyone saying that the really foolish thing that people often say about him what do they say they say I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the same thing the Jewish leaders went through at that time. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher 
he would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a good, a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And this is what C.S. Lewis said about that. And that is absolutely true. Jesus did not come to say he's a great teacher. What did he come? He came to proclaim he is the Lord and Savior. He came to save the world. And yet people just don't see that at all. In a book titled The 100, anthropologist Michael Hart asked a provocative question. <laughs> Michael Hart, right? Astrophysicist. Astrophysicist, wow. Who are the 100 most influential people in history? Of all the human beings who have ever lived, who has had the deepest impact on our lives today? Who would you think the answer would have been? Grandma. Grandma. Actually, Jesus was number three on his list. I haven't figured out, but he put Muhammad and Isaac Newton above Jesus. Now, I'm still trying to struggle out on how that one worked out. You know? You would have thought, but this is the way the list came out, didn't it? So I want to ask you some things here. It says, 2,000 years ago, Jesus changed the world. Do you realize that here it is, a child was born 2,000 years ago, and this child lived on the earth for, what, 33 years? Nothing famous about him. As we all know, he's born of a carpenter, and yet he changed the world. And we say, how can one person change the world at such a level? Individual. What does it say in there? It says, Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1, 27. He would come to live inside of us, guiding and empowering us to live meaningful and godly lives. Do you realize that's what he did? He changed every one of us and comes and lives inside of us. This is just from one man and what did he give us in exchange? He says, when I leave, I will give you the Holy Spirit, didn't he? We'll come and empower you. And what do we find out? Each of us has him indwelling inside of us today. Did he really leave? No. He's still with us right here. How about women? Did he make a change for women? says, Jesus' teaching and examples reconfirm the truth that in every way from the time of creation, women are of equal worth as men in God's sight, including their com complementary roles in the marriage relationship. What do you mean women are equal with men? Not God's. But do you realize that until then, women never had rights? And Christianity brought the thought of women having rights into the world, where we started treating women on the equal basis as we were. Look back through all of the Old Testament and look back through history. Did women ever have equal footing as men? Never. But yet, that's what Jesus brought for us. Family life. Jesus' teachings gave permanent strength and completeness to the world's most important institution, the family. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Husband, love your, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. He put structure together in the family, didn't he? And he made sure that we understood it's an equal partnership. The church, no group of people have made a more positive impact on the history of the world than the Christian church. 
He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What did he change? He changed the fellowship of people together. He changed the outreach that happens from a church. Who's the organizations that go in first? The Christian organizations, isn't it? Anytime there's a disaster, we know who's going to be there first. There's no government going to be there first. Governments always wait until it's safe, as they say it. Three days, at least. But we're there the moment it happens. It's amazing. They're standing right in the middle of it. Do you realize that Jesus brought us to civil government? Prior to the Christian faith being applied to civil government, people lived in fear. But after the coming of Christ, the biblical role of civil government government began to emerge through the mega magna carta and we talked about it what it brought to us in the past republican governments democratic principles and human rights the authorities that exist are appointed by god he is god's minister to you for good an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil evil that's what romans tells us the right to vote came from christ where we realized that we were on equal terms with everybody else on it. Education says, In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2.3 Did you know the printing of the Gutenberg Bible was considered by Time Magazine the most important event in the past 500 years because it made truth and knowledge easily available to the masses? The first 120 universities in America, beginning with Harvard, were started by followers of Christ for the advancement of the Christian faith. Wow. What is the most printed book in the world? The Bible. What is the most read book in the Bible, in the world? The Bible. What is the most given out book in the world? The Bible. See, it's still the most popular book there is. People still buy it today. Amazing, isn't it? How old's that book? Business. Jesus changed business. He said, Do your work heartily as unto the Lord, not to men. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. It says Colossians 3.23. It says, Even the development of human work, labor, and industry during the Christ Christianizing of Europe as believers applied biblical concepts to labor and industry, which eventually became free enterprise, capitalism that led the world out of its mass poverty, it formed the creation of the middle class and individual freedoms. Did you know that? It's when we finally realized that we were equal to our employers. The employers start treating people on an equal basis. That came through Christianity, through the teachings of Jesus Christ. Science, and we've talked about science many times in the past. All things were made through him, and without him nothing has been made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. John 1, 3, and 4. It says, it was the Christian faith that proposed the design points to a designer, and that man was placed on the earth to discover God's secrets in nature and use those discoveries to benefit mankind. Many discoveries were based upon biblical passions leading to better understanding. And that's true even today. It was not that many years ago that somebody read that passage that says that there are streams in the ocean. And he did the study to find out there was streams in the ocean, didn't he? And there's river currents and ocean currents and all this other stuff that came by. All of this came by one man who changed the world. Can you imagine? Is there anybody else we can refer to that has changed the world? Did Muhammad change the world this great? No. Did Isaac Newton change the world this great? No. They may come up with great ideas. The arts says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make a melody in your hearts to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. It says, Francis 
Schaefer pointed out in his book, How Should We Then Live?, that was coming of Christ greatly influenced the arts and that prior to Christ's birth, music was played in minor chords. Do you realize that? Showing the incompleteness and lack of harmony in life. After Christ's death and resurrection brought wholeness to individuals and nations, people began creating major chord music and realistic art, an expression of their re reconciliation to God. This is, who, this is why more hymns and songs have been written about Jesus than any other person in history. And we sing those songs today, don't we? And number 10, faith that Jesus may dwell in your hearts through faith, Ephesians 3, 7. It says, believe in Jesus Christ has changed the lives of not millions, billions of people lives have been changed and that's going on even today it was let it has led his followers to the centuries to care for the poor minister to the sick start hospitals and schools share the good news around the world apply christian principles to government economics and social issues and influence every other engine of progress their their faith makes them the best leaders soldiers, caregivers, and husbands and wives. War against evil have been won through valiant faith. Individual lives have been rescued through tender faith. It is hard to imagine a world without faith in God and our Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot imagine how one person changed the world so much. And what did he bring to us? He brought to us salvation, didn't he? He brought to us hope. He brought to us the fact that we have something to look forward to. It changed the whole world. When you have a different perspective on life, instead of thinking, oh, just another dredge day is coming up, and you can say, I'm looking for the day I get to spend eternity with my father, it changes your whole perspective of life. This is what Jesus brought to us. He changed the whole world on that basis. So let's go back to our scripture reading for just a minute. It says this. Now Jesus had just fed the 5,000. He had been a very busy man, so it wasn't like the disciples should have known who he was by now. He'd done miracles everywhere he went. But most people looked at him as just being a great miracle worker. They didn't think about who he really was, the Savior of the world. And it happened as he was alone praying, the disciples joined him. And he asked them, saying, who do the crowds say that I am? Now, they should have heard. I'm sure a lot of people were referring to who Jesus was back then. So the answer said, John the Baptist. I'm sure Herod was kind of were nervous about that one. Wasn't he the one that had his head chopped off? You know, we read in there where Herod, once he heard that Jesus was around and somebody had told him, well, this may be John the Baptist, he was just inquisitive as can be. He wanted to go see who this person was. Well, as you get further on in the chapter 16, down the line of ways, what do we find out? Herod gets his chance to meet Jesus. Does it change Herod's life? No, just great inquisitive he just wanted to know who this guy was that's all it was so they answered and said john the baptist but some say elijah and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again he said to them but who do you say i am that's a good question to ask who do you say he is jesus answered and said the christ of god now, what does the word Christ mean? It means the anointed one, doesn't it? So Jesus, Peter said he is the anointed one of God. Can we say that? Do we refer to Jesus as our friend? Do we refer to him as a great prophet? Or should we refer to him as our Lord and Savior? 
I think sometimes a lot of us refer to Jesus as our friend and we treat him as our friend. We don't actually treat him as Lord and Savior. We just treat him as a good buddy to have along beside you as you need him. And we don't spend the time that we need to in who he really is. It says, And he strictly warned and commanded him to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things. He's telling them the future here. And be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised the third day. See, he's told him exactly what the future has in store for him. Did they listen? Did they know what he said? It wasn't until later they finally understood what he said. But he's already explained to them what's going on. Then he said to them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily to follow me. You know what that means? That means humility. How many of us are willing to set the very things of our pride and set them aside to follow Jesus Christ? This may mean we go down paths we never intended to go down. This may mean he points us in different directions that we never thought we would go. But we must be willing to follow him. And he will direct our paths. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does it mean, whoever desires to save his life will lose it? What is it? It's called pride, isn't it? Those people that want to hang on to life, it's called pride. I want to be in control. I always want to be the one who determines the direction I am going. But he says you need to set that aside. For what profit it is to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes into his own glory and in his father's and his in, in his father's and of the holy angels so the question we ask is who do you say i am who do you say he is do you say he is your lord and savior or you just say he's a good friend He's a great prophet. He's a great teacher. I'm glad I read the Bible because I learned a lot of great stuff from it. Or do you really every day give your life to him and are willing to follow him every day even though the circumstances may not be the outcome you would like to see? That's tough to do. But that's what he's asking us to do. I want to be Lord of every day. I just don't want to be Lord of the Sabbath. I want to be Lord of every day in your life. Brings us back to John 20, 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in him. 2,000 years ago, a child was born. 300 prophecies tell us the life of Christ. How he's going to be born, where he's going to be born, everything. And yet, today, we have people who find it very hard to believe that he even came. Jesus came, died on the cross for you and me, so that we could spend eternity with him. That's a choice we have to make, isn't it? But you know, this Christmas season, we're celebrating his birth. We're celebrating the very fact that he came for me. And he came for you. I want to call him my Lord and Savior. And every day, I want to call him my Lord and Savior. 
And when it, com when it comes to the decisions that have to be made about whether I choose between Jesus and I choose between the world, what choice should I pick? I pick Jesus every time. Now, we'll make mistakes. Thank God he gave us repentance for those mistakes. So this Christmas, let's celebrate the one who came, our Lord and Savior. Father, we do thank you, Lord. Of all of the names out there, you are Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Lord, we just pray that we will remember that, we will honor that, we will put pride aside, we will humbly serve you and do whatever you ask us to do and be sensitive to the very things. And we thank you, Lord, for your son. We thank you that you brought him into the world and he was willing to follow through everything to go to that cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.